Hello and welcome to the wisdomfactory.net. I'm Heidi, I'm living in Italy. And as November is about, that's traditionally the month of death and dying. As maybe somebody of you knows, I did a series about conscious living, conscious dying two years ago uh, in occasion of the death of my husband, with whom before we did quite a extensive uh, series of conscious aging. Since he is gone, it has become a little less, but I'm still remembering conscious aging work and especially conscious dying, as I understood that this is not a very common topic. And when you face it, then, you know, you have almost nobody to talk about. And so today I invited David Lorimer and he is really doing a lot of work. And one of that is about death and dying. And we want to talk about that today. And before we go into the topic, I would like to ask you to introduce yourself, David. Yes, thank you, Heidi. Thank you for inviting me on. Well, my um, uh, history, as it were, with death and dying goes, goes back quite a long way. Um, as I wrote my first book in my early 30s, um, published in 1984, called Survival, question mark, Body, Mind and Death in the Light of Psychic Experience. And then my second book was called Hole in One, um, now called Resonant Mind. And that was uh, subtitled The Near-Death Experience and the Ethic of Interconnectedness. And this was about the implications of the life review. Um, <clears throat> and so this, this is uh, central from an ethical point of view, I think. And then at the same time, um, I was involved in um, the International Association for Near-Death Studies in the UK. I was the vice president and edited the newsletter. Um, and. <clears throat> and I also was, con I was in contact with uh, the, the French and Belgian versions. I helped set those up as well in the late 1980s. And, and my, my books also translated into French. Um, and then now um, I, um, I've been principally involved with the Scientific and Medical Network. Um, <clears throat> and we put on um, a number of um, uh, events, uh, webinars, uh, which people can find on our website, mysticsandscientists.org. Uh, and in September, we collaborated on a, top, on a topic exactly on what we're going to be talking about today on, on uh, uh, lessons from the dying for life and living with the Institute of Genetic Sciences. And it seems to me that um, an awareness of death um, is something that uh, memento mori that um, we really need to, to maintain. Um, and uh, this morning, in fact, I was listening to an extraordinary interview between um, <coughs> uh, Elizabeth um, Colbert, um, Gilbert, sorry, Elizabeth Gilbert, and Oprah Winfrey uh, about the death of her, um, her lover. And, and uh, she said that somebody, a wise person, had said to her that death is the only thing that's completely certain in the contract of life, and yet it always takes us by surprise. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was quite a... <laughs> uh, an interesting and, and pertinent remark in, in the circumstance. Yeah. And even if you know that it is about to happen, it's still a surprise. And But before we go into that, uh, I, I wonder how you, you already wrote about that 30 years ago and even longer, and you were quite young. So that's very unusual that young people think about dying. So how did you get into that? Oh, well, I remember actually it was the summer of 1982 and I was teaching at Winchester College and, and in fact I completed almost the entire book over the summer holidays. I was rather exhausted as you can imagine by the time I went back to teach. Uh, and my father said that I, I really, what, what did I have to offer um, that hadn't already been said and, and why wasn't I actually spending my holiday enjoying myself rather than writing a book. Uh, but I, I felt very um, involved and um, I felt I did have something to say um, that hadn't all completely been said by other people. And, and it seemed to me a, a very important topic. So I, I conceived of the, the book, the sort of two volumes in a sense. The first volume um, is asking, well, what actually happens at death? Does something happen or does nothing happen? Is death a transition to another realm or is it extinction? And the second one it was looking more at the ethical implications um, of the near-death experience, and particularly 
and the mystical experience that often happens in near death and the life review, which I, which I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. And it seemed to me, and it still seems to me that if, if people really knew um, that their, their life was going to be revisited and, and that they were going to feel what it was like to be other people involved on the receiving end of what they did, and it would give them pause for thought um, in uh, their actions and relationships to other people, because ultimately I believe we are one another. So what we do to others, in inverted commas, we're actually doing to ourselves. So you come more f came from the end of the mystical uh, experiences to, to in inquire into death? Well, not, not, not totally, no. Um, my mother was a sensitive. And, and so I had um, some experiences that you know, I, I realized I had, was acquainted with some of the experiences that she had. And, and that, that got me thinking about these things at quite an early age. And, and I also, in my last year at university, I started reading Swedenborg. And Swedenborg was a, an 18th century scientist, philosopher, engineer, and mystic, um, who in his mid 50s started having um, direct experiences of the spiritual world and being able to speak and communicate with people who had passed over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really interesting. So I wonder what is now your idea? What will happen when we die? You said uh, this is a life review. And then can we know about uh, the near-death experiences, which are very beautiful, no? Can we think that this is really also the death experience? What do you think? Yes, I actually think it is the death experience. Uh, I mean, in my in my book, um, I had a chapter. It's my original book. I, I had a chapter on near death experiences, and then I had a chapter on uh, ostensible communications about what it was like to die. So, in other words, post mortem communications. And if you look at a series of cases, which I, which I obviously did, then the similarities are overwhelming. And, and so it, it's really a, a matter of, of leaving the body behind like a suit of old clothes and, and then um, making a transition into another state. And <clears throat> so, so I, we can't know exactly, um, but we can get enough hints I think, from um, the literature um, that's been recorded. Mm -hmm. So, so I, 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 that, that's, that's my sort of current view at any rate. Okay, so um, we hear that most of these near-death experiences are very positive. And uh, people even say they don't, didn't want to come back and uh, only somebody told them they have to go back or somebody called them to, to back and so on. So, if this is the case, why are we so fearful of death? Well, I think it's a taboo in our culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, the, our culture is very material and um, it, it, it concentrated on the outside of things rather than the inside. Um, but, but in fact, life is all about what goes on on the inside. And, and I have an educational project, um, <clears throat> which I do with young people aged 10 to 16, which mm -hmm. encourages them to, to realize that that they can happen to life, not just life happening to them. And, and so, so I encourage them to develop a sense of, of purpose and intent um, at that point. And I used to be a teacher myself at, at uh, Winchester College. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I find it very interesting because um, there are people either by um, too much pain or whatever, they enter into a state of unconsciousness before they die, or they even want to be unconscious uh, to die. And so I wonder if they lose this. I mean, I, I agree. I think it is a very important um, transition and I, I want to be there when it happens, you know, but why are so many people just not how can you say trying to 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 deaden themselves for not for not being there for it as if it they can avoid it? <laughs> yes, well, I, I think we really need a new story uh, around this, and, and the 
uh, my, my friend and colleague, Dr. Peter Fennick, um, has developed a, a lot of work and done a lot of research on what he calls end of life experiences, ELEs. And he, he's charted the various things that tend to happen to people um, in the last week or so. When, for instance, um, people, this is if they're lucid, obviously, um, mm -hmm. they, will, they will tend to be between two realities um, where sometimes they will be in the physical focus and other times their focus will go into uh, another dimension. So they'll begin, for instance, to perceive relatives and um, some you know, people who come and take them away, as it were, or help through the transition. And, and sometimes you get this extraordinary phenomenon of terminal lucidity, um, where people with dementia um, suddenly become lucid for a short period before they die. And they make some sort of remark indicating that they're going, um, they've been asked to go um, by a loved one uh, and, and they're, they're, they're off. Mm -hmm. So they not only choose to go, but they, they, they feel that they're past to go. And so they can be in peace with it. Yeah. Yes, I mean, mon the, there's work done by a Swiss um, nurse um, uh, and a theologian by, called Monica Rentz. And she's mm -hmm. worked mainly with cancer patients. And, and obviously cancer is a, is a circumstance when um, the process is gradual um, and often conscious and you know you know things are coming to an end um, and you, there's a certain um, sort of time frame, if you like. And she's, she's focusing, and Peter Fennec's focusing a lot on this now as well, on the, on the transcendence, um, that, that this, this sense of letting go of the self, so letting go of the body, which we have to surrender the body. But it also seems we have to surrender who we think we are, what, what Jeffrey Martin calls the narrative self or the ego. And, and that, that letting go is, is also a, a passageway to an expanded sense of being, I think. Mm -hmm. so that's, that's how I interpret it. Obviously, yeah. I haven't eaten that yet myself. And so uh, I can't say anything more. I can only try and interpret um, sure. the patterns that I, I'm trying to understand. Sure, sure. Uh, I'm thinking about, you were naming the ego. Uh, people who want to end their lives without any particular reason, is it that their ego says, I want to keep the command, I want to decide, uh, um, you know, in, in Netherlands, you can, you can have, you, can, you, oh, I don't know how to. Euthanasia. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I'm wondering if, if this is a, uh, a good way to die for two reasons. I have a friend whose father said, yeah, he is not uh, in the profession anymore. He was a high standing professional and he doesn't feel any purpose in life anymore. And he doesn't want to become de dementia or to degrade. And so he decided, and he said in one year or in some months, I will do euthanasia. And he told that the family and they still went together still for a holiday and something. And I saw that the family was suffering. And I thought, is this a good way? If you want to do it, do it, but don't, <laughs> don't make suffer your, 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 your family. And isn't that an egocentric decision? I mean, if you are really, you know, there are cases where that pain is really horrible and then I wouldn't say the same thing, but when you are just for fear that maybe in a certain moment in some years you couldn't govern yourself and that's why you die now, why you decide to die now, is that? Is that? Yeah. An... It's, a, it's a very interesting case. And I, I read of another uh, in the French newspaper of somebody who'd set a date um, for, you know, rather than in a similar way. Um, and then when the date came round, she decided to give herself an extension. Um, of, you know, so she wanted, wanted to go on living. But my, my question would be, um, on what basis are they actually doing this, making this kind of decision? Is it because they think they are going to snuff themselves out as a result? In other words, they've got the extinction model in mind. Um, or do they think that this, this, they want to make an early transition? Um, and I suppose uh, what a lot of people would say 
um, if you say, well, I'm with an early transition, well, you actually haven't finished the agenda yet. And, and there, so there's, you need the, I mean, with Elizabeth Gilbert this morning was very moving when she said, I want to experience the whole of life. I'll take the whole package. Now, even if it involves uh, difficulties and sufferings and challenges, I'm up for it. And I think at one level, um, that's what we, as it were, sign up for. We sign up for the package and the package includes all sorts of aspects as, as you know, anybody who's lived will, will know. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that because when we think that this is a transition, we also can agree that maybe we choose to come here for a certain reason and with certain tasks to resolve. And, you know, and okay, maybe the task is to decide to, to kill yourself. I don't know, but <laughs> I was just wondering if this is an egocentric decision to want to be in command of their own life and not to surrender. You said surrendering is in the last moment. And also Kübler Rosh, she says, you go through the different uh, stages, no? And at the end, you accept that you will be dying. And actually, it's what I hope that will be the case when it's my time coming. So... Well, it's very... It's, uh, it's, I, one has, I hesitate to judge anybody um, without knowing their circumstances. And, and, and the, there's a, a sense of compassion that I think we have to have for each other um, and understanding. And the French have this, this wonderful phrase, you know, to understand all is to forgive all. And, and so, uh, you know, one shouldn't, one has to be really humble about these, these, these topics and just uh, explore in a spirit of openness um, and other, mm. everybody has to come to their own view. Yeah. So, and then another question, if you decide to kill yourself, and before I had another uh, friend long ago, and he was always fearful of dying, and then he killed himself. And is the fear going away when you decide to do it? Or what about the fear? Uh, I mean, let's explore a little bit the fear uh, component of death and dying. Yes, I uh, I don't know, you know, what his circumstance and attitude was, but I will tell you a story which I thought was a very interesting one from Bruce Grayson, and um, who's got a book coming out next year. He was a professor of uh, psychiatry at University of Virginia and one of the world experts on near-death experiences. And he's he he told this story at a conference that I attended where he was giving a lecture, and he said that man who got into real financial difficulties, and so he decided to commit suicide, and and he went out um, to hang himself in his garden shed. And he 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 did the job, and then he found himself outside his body, and he wasn't dead or wasn't yet dead, <clears throat> and decided he'd made a mistake, and so he. He went into the kitchen, when I say he, in other words, his consciousness um, went into the kitchen where his wife was chopping vegetables. And, and she tried to, he tried to attract her attention, which of course he couldn't do physically. But then he went inside her head and he thought to himself, I'm hanging up in the shed, please come and cut me down. And the wife heard the very, very words inside her head. Um, and uh, rushed out to the garden, found him, cut him down, and lived to tell the tale. Uh, and so um, the, his conclusion from trying that was that it, it was a mistake and, and, you know, from, from, from his point of view. And I don't know how the, the fear element um, is, I think, also wired into the physical body. The physical body has a survival and, and fight and flight response wired into the um, you know, the reptilian brain even. And, and so, I, so I think there is a fear in the body um, the fear of pain um, in any event. Um, but the, 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 it also depends on, as we were saying before, what sort of story you, you tell yourself about what life is and, and therefore what death is. And um, I think that the, the, the dying themselves say that you, you, we, you really should live life to the full um, and um, love is very, very important. Wisdom and understanding is very important and, and service to other people 
is very important. So I I I feel that we can we can learn enormous amount um, from people who have arrived um, at that point and are looking back on their lives. And I I felt that. I mean, I remember another story from Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, which had a big influence on me at the time. I went to a lecture by her <clears throat> in London at St. James's Piccadilly Church. And she said, um, I had a patient once and uh, he was just retiring um, after working very hard. He's looking forward to his retirement. And he was told that he only had six weeks to live. He had a terminal condition. And he said, and I've never forgotten this, he said, I made a good living, but I never really lived. Mm. <clears throat> and I thought to myself, I never want to have to say that. And I was, I was in my what, 20 or 30s probably at the time. Um, but it's something I decided very early on um, that um, I, I, uh, my, I felt a sense of responsibility for using my lifetime constructively. Um, now going right back to when I was about 22. Well, yeah, that's very early. Yeah, and I, I heard it often that um, the most regret of people uh, when they die is that they haven't lived enough, that they didn't do what they wanted to do. So that could be an um, inspiration for who is listening to think about what did you want to do in your life and never did, maybe, especially- and you after can still pension. do it. Yeah, you can still That's do it. it. You know, when you, so many men, especially when they uh, get going into pension, they lose their job in many ways, then they don't know what to do because they define themselves on, uh, by their work. And so, you know, instead of filling them with um, drugs because uh, the depression is considered an illness or something, maybe we should help them to <laughs> to live life, you know, to live that what they really wanted to do. What do you think about that? Yes, well, <clears throat> I think you have to retire to something as well as from something. Ah, um, that's a good. Uh... And and um, some people do it just in their, uh, they retire onto the golf course, uh, which you know, is the worst thing is to do from point of view <laughs> of enjoyment and exercise. Um, but the, the the underlying point you're making, which I think is very important one is that people invest their identity in their job and and um, therefore when they no longer have that position um, then um, they feel bereft it's a sort of a grief um, reaction and, and a, a, quite a significant number of men who find themselves in that situation um, they um, they die within 18 months mm -hmm. and, and they, they seem to sort of lose all energy and sense of direction uh, so, so I actually think that uh, retirement should ideally be phased um, in that way. So, for instance, in the French teaching system, you can um, you can go down to three days a week in your fifties, and and then you know withdraw more gradually. And, and I think a lot of people want to keep active, and if it was possible to, um, you know, just reduce your number of days or hours without um, you know, stopping altogether, and um, that's probably a better transition. Um, but I think it is—it's worth uh, asking yourself if you're in this situation. You know, what 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 am I going to retire to? That's a good. It's a good uh, question to ask because normally people go into retirement either because they have to, because they are getting too old, and law says they have to go out or because they want to flee from what they did before because it was not satisfactory. And then maybe they, like Mark, my uh, late husband did, he was in America and went to Florida in a retirement uh, center. And then after one year on the beach, he thought uh, that's not really yeah. <laughs> what I thought it would be, you know? So even our ideas, our illusions that we have the nicest life possible. After a while, it's boring. So we really need a little bit more of uh, of meaning in in life, no? Yes, I I think so. But I was just reading something this morning. Um, my my, my <clears throat> um, main sort of spiritual teacher, if you like, is somebody called Peter Dunov, um, who lived from 1864 to 1944, and he was Bulgarian. 
and uh, I read Bulgarian. So I was reading a passage this morning um, about love and service, um, and that we don't really feel a sense of meaning and purpose unless we're unless we're in loving service of some kind to to other people. And so it's not. Uh, it's very nice being on the beach and having a nice glass of wine or champagne. Or I mean, I'm, I'm not allergic to that at all myself. Um, but but I, I I feel that um, fulfillment comes from um, looking outwards um, to what you can do um, for other people and for the world in general, um, rather than just um, you know satisfying your own desires. Yeah, and this is also a recipe for not dying early, you know, because I I am convinced that when you are in a situation where you retired from and have no idea what your oh how do I call that? It's not identity. It's your purpose. Your 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 soul needs are then, and you are living only in your head. You were used to live only in your head. That then you have no idea what what you could do, what you could be, no? And so it's very easy that you fall into a depression and into something which then weakens the immune system and then comes something, uh, it might be a normal flu or now maybe the COVID thing, you know? And then you might die more easily than when you have a real purpose in life and you are active to fulfill on that. What do you think? Yes, no, that? I agree. I think this is the... The sort of attitudes, it's a link between um, your your outlook and your immune system. And so depre depression is going to depress your immune system correspondingly, and um, whereas the opposite is also true. Mm -hmm. Depression and also fear, no? I mean, uh, fear is not a good thing to live with. And you go into stress, and stress is consuming or everything and so your immune system is lowering and so for instance when we were thinking to talk also a little bit about COVID no when uh, when you are so fearful completely fearful to get it and then you know go into stress and maybe it's a self-fulfilling prophecy in some way you know then you, you might even get it more than when you are calm and do things, for instance, like that was recommended, it would have been a good occasion, stop smoking. Some people still smoke, no? and they load their, their um, lungs with not good things. And, you know, that's the other thing, which I'm really wondering. People are fearful, but they are not willing to, to give up these things which are harmful to them. So, you know, are so fearful of death, but they continue to drink or to to, to smoke heavily. So, <sighs> I suppose the addiction is you know, can be very strong, yeah. and, and and the habits um, as well. You know, if you can break a habit, then that's that that's quite quite something in in life. And it takes it takes a few days or about three weeks apparently to you know change your habits um, completely, and then it becomes the normal and. Um, I think Goethe said, everything is difficult before it is easy. Yeah. And changing habits, I have heard 40 days, you have to be uh, consistent and then it's it's changing. But I want to, to go a moment to, to a webinar which I've heard uh, in your channels. Uh, it was about the role of psychedelics of uh, a so leaving, no, how do you say, of e easening, uh, of taking away the fear of death, for instance, but also to change uh, bad habits. I wonder if you want to talk a little bit about that, because in my opinion, we are missing out on some easy ways of becoming healthy, let's say, or also without fear, because of prejudices which have been written into law. <laughs> yes, I'm not quite sure exactly what you're referring to, but one of the interesting things that um, I've found in, in um, listening to the research on um, you know, psychedelics psychotherapy um, is, is that it's, it's actually the mystical experience uh, during that um, process 
um, <clears throat> which is which is the critical one. And and I, I think that was in the, um, the 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 fantastic fungi film. There was a yes, section exactly. on that, um, mm -hmm. and that that's something I also heard you know from an academic presentation in in Interlaken, um, and that it it also relates to near death experience that the if people have a mystical experience of oneness and unity, non separation, non duality, and uh, then they they know they belong, and more than that, many will say, I know I am loved. It's not something that um, is theoretical. I, I know it in my, in my bones. I know that. And, and that's something which is um, hard for us to imagine if you haven't had the um, experience yourself, which I, I, haven't, I haven't had that, that kind of experience. Uh, but, it, but it does point to um, the, the altered states of consciousness and the therapeutic use um, and indeed the sacramental use um, of um, you know, plant substances to give a, a sense of wholeness um, it, at a time when um, you know, people are seeking in that way. Um, so I, they, they, what, what happened, as I think the film also explained, is that the, this, all, this sort of research was going on in the 1950s, then the 1960s came along and, and that swept in a you know, we, a huge <clears throat> um, wave of, of liberation. And, and it's not a, and Graham Hancock, I think, takes this view that an you know, anti uh, hallucinogens and anti fungal, as it were, uh, culture, um, you know, cuts itself off from something. As you said, it's, it's you know, these things are illegal. Um, yeah. But I think the context um, the sacred context is is an important one, uh, and that's what happens if you, I believe, if you go to Peru um, <clears throat> and do an ayahuasca um, session um, with the elders, then it's all ritualized, which it was also in the film. Yeah, yeah, and I also saw many uh, videos from John Hopkins University, and also in Switzerland, there are people uh, researching that, and some of them have been excommunicated from their jobs and so on because it's illegal but um, I have this experience and I did uh, did realize that after the death of my husband I was in depression also outwardly I was functioning doing things but I, I felt it was not that and after that uh, in some how can I say not immediately, but after some weeks, I noticed, who depression is gone. You know, it's sort of uh, a liberating. It slowly went on, or I didn't even realize. I was excited about the experience, you know. It was nice, and I thought, oh, good, good, good. So that, <laughs> and then at a certain moment, I noticed, oh, it did something to me, you know. And so since then, I'm really an advocate to liberate the mushrooms and the fungi. I, by the way, I bought the book from uh, Merlin Sheldrake. Merlin. Great. I, I love it. And I didn't know so many things about this under entangled world, this mm. world. It's but a the, fascinating book. It's, it's amazing. It's really amazing. I recommend to everybody to, to, to read it. I, I have only started, but I saw him in the interview in the in the presentation and he is like his father very clear and very sympathetic in bringing over his his um what he really knows you no know? it's not he just talks i would just talk you know but he really knows what he is talking about he does. and you can read it yeah. also in the book you, you feel it that there's deep research behind and he is not just saying something you know so really good and they were also uh, talking about these experiences, no? Uh, in a part, I, I will still arrive there in the book, uh, about the, let's say, importance of using means, which are, by the way, uh, ma magic mushrooms are on the lowest level of harmfulness for from all drugs. Alcohol is somewhere there, and mushrooms are somewhere mm -hmm. there. So Interesting. There is yeah. no no real reason why it should be forbidden you know so and when you see people in pain 
they have also done experiments uh, with pain patients and uh, it could help. So why don't we do that? <sighs> yeah, <laughs> but let's go over to, to COVID uh, and this uh, fear of death. In my opinion, all these looking for numbers and shutdowns and things and this and that, it's because we have a collective fear of death and we don't want to face it. We don't want to, to find a way to include death in our, in our lives. What is your idea about yeah, that? Yeah, no, I think that's right. Um, and right back, you know, quite, quite a few months ago, I, I read a, an essay by Charles Eisenstein uh, making mm -hmm. exactly that point. <clears throat> um, that the, this is a, a manifestation of our collective fear of death um, that we're, we, we're overreacting um, to uh, a situation which, although it's serious, um, no, the, the, not, the, the real numbers um, no, are, not as, are not so serious as to warrant the kind of social measures that have been brought out. Um, <clears throat> and so, so I, I, do th I do think that's right. And there's, a, there's obviously a subconscious um, element um, to this as well. Um, and, and, and so it, it's, it sort of, it's pressed that button, if you like, collectively. Yeah, it definitely has. I think at the beginning is my personal view. At the beginning, when nobody knew what it is, I think it was right to react uh, with cautious, cautious, cautious. But now we know so much more and I think we should rely on, on our, first of all, propagate to strengthen the immune system by whatever way it is. I don't hear that in public news. No, so, no. It, the government hasn't given that message at all. Uh, the vaccine message is the main one that comes across. And, and that's, that's been drilled into people so much that people just repeat it without realizing what the implications are. Yeah. We, we had a presentation on that a few weeks ago from Rob for Kirk. And, and he's, he's the founder and, and uh, president of the Alliance for Health International, which he set up. And he's a scientist um, and somebody who I think has a very clear eyed um, view on the situation. And, and what he gave us was all factual and evidence-based. So that's mm -hmm. a talk that, <clears throat> that, that can be found on our, our website under the sort of previous webinars. Yeah, at the end, I would like you to give us a little bit more of the information because I saw also that conscious aging webinars are coming up, but still let, let us go a little bit with the, with the COVID thing. Um, seen from an integral perspective, what we are seeing in our uh, world now, it's only the outside quadrants, only the look on, on the things, but world is all four quadrants, that the inside and the culture and the outside, the science and also the systems. We are at the moment mainly concerned with science and systems and we discover the insufficiency of the systems to respond on to, to this challenge. But we hardly ever think about culture and about the um, the impact on, 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 on the psyche, on, on, on ourselves, on the interiority. So that cannot be a solution when we use means which are only, which are sort of um, limping. <laughs> you know? Yes, so, the, the, it, that reflects the, um, the culture as a whole, because uh, our culture is, is extroverted. Um, it thinks that what's really real is on the outside. So much so that um, philosophers and psychologists don't really think the mind is real. Uh, and th this, this is something that we look at in another of our initiatives called the Galileo Commission, where we're trying to um, expand science beyond its rather limited materialistic worldview. Um, so that's a, more, that's, a more, that's a more general point. But you're right, the, the interiority um, is, is not... And the, and, the, and the question of attitude, that, that's not really, it's not really addressed because our freedom, as Viktor Frankl points out in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, our freedom is to choose our attitude. So we can all choose um, a, a constructive attitude towards the current circumstances and, and look on them as an, actually an opportunity to ask these deeper questions and to see whether we can't arrive at a, a major system change 
um, in the direction of, of a more sustainable relationship to nature, for instance, because that's one of the things that, that uh, Merlin said in his, his talk, um, was that they, uh, the, the bottom line is, is the way we try to exploit nature uh, and more, more, more than that, the way that we've allowed uh, gain of function research, um, which is biological weapons research by any other name, um, and, and it's being done all around the world, again, because of fear. And because he, he, the fear is that your opponent might get the technology and use it against you. So you better be doing it as well. But it's mutually assured madness, mutually assured destruction. And, and from a point of view of the human species as a whole, uh, we're crazy uh, not to halt this uh, forthwith and outlaw it. Yeah, yeah, really crazy. And that would also have been a, a chance for, uh, maybe it should have been prepared though, to take, taking, making people responsible for their own acts. Now, when it is ordered with, um, you know, you you can need to pay fines when you don't behave like they want us to behave, then uh, your own responsibility is not asked. Your own uh, attitude, as you said, what is your attitude? We are not even asked to develop an attitude. We just have to obey. And I think yeah. this is a, um, a way of being which in our Western cultures we should have overcome in some way. But we, we go back, in many ways, we go back into restriction and into domination and uh, many things. By the way, I uh, obey the rules because I think, okay, uh, I don't mind, I do that. I don't have to, to, to rebel against it because I know I'm not the rule and I'm, you know, I have the freedom to do that or not to do that. But still uh, to not trust the people that they would do the best if they are informed well, and they are not informed well, in my opinion, uh, it's, it's a backlash for, for society and for our, yeah, for our- Indeed. Um, could we just pause the recording for a moment? Yes, please. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. We start again, and you, David, you have fixed your internet problem, so it's fine. We can go on, and maybe we do a sort of um, summary of what we were talking about, and also maybe if you can give some inspiration to people who are concerned with the topic death and dying and you may also give your um, information about what you are doing. Well, I think the very limitations of life <clears throat> uh, make it precious. You know, we, we have, we all have a limited amount of time. We don't know how much we've got. Um, you know, that doesn't say, um, <clears throat> you know, that our life is going to end on a particular day. Uh, it's open-ended. It might be shorter, it might be longer, um, <clears throat> but it, what it means is that we have to pay attention to the quality of what we do, uh, our relationships, and who we are, and who we strive to become, and, and, and what the whole process of a maturing human being is. Um, I remember in that respect, I went to visit one of the uh, early followers of um, <clears throat> Peter Dunoff in Bulgaria, and he was 90. And he lived in a very simple place. <clears throat> and, and he didn't speak any English. And at that point, I didn't speak a huge amount of Bulgarian. Uh, but I, I sat in his presence, I was privileged to sit in his presence. And he was just giving out uh, a vibration of love and wisdom. And I thought, here is a truly mature, ripe human being, someone who has actually embodied these essential principles and, and who's devoted his life to these. And, and so it's, it's, it's eventually it's, it's who we are as beings and that um, people can get a, a sense of. And, and that's the kind of alchemical process of, 
of transforming ourselves from lead into gold, as it were. Um, and it's an ongoing process and it's never complete. But I think the important thing for me um, is to have a, a compass direction. <clears throat> and I, I, I have a presentation which is, which is called Towards a Culture of Love and Wisdom. And, and <clears throat> this, is, this is what I feel uh, we need to be traveling towards, which includes uh, a, a culture that is self-sustaining and that has a harmonious relationship with nature, that works with nature rather than against it. We work with other people rather than against them. We realize that we're on one planet um, and that the whole interest of the planet uh, should be primary, not the interests of individual nations or individual companies. And so we're, we're, all, we're part of this larger organism um, whereby if we can put the, la the health of the larger organism first, then of course, our health will, will result from um, the health and the attention we pay to the health of the whole planet. And so it's, it's a win-win um, situation, if you like. And in order to arrive there, we need a fundamental change in our, our worldview you know, towards um, that away from mechanistic understanding of things uh, towards uh, an organic uh, embedded understanding of things. Um, which well, there's a lot of thinking around in that way, all the systems theory, the ecological thinking, um, <clears throat> the, 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 the ideas of symbiosis, of synergy, you know, all, all of these thoughts are there already, um, but they really need to be prioritized um, so that we, we reorient our systems in, in that, that direction. Yeah, and what with, with what you are doing, you are doing your part in this direction. So, yes, I, I, I'm trying to, I mean, my, my whole life is about education. Um, and so I've, I've been president of various um, uh, organizations, you know, connected with, with education, Recon Trust, which was founded by Sir George Trevelyan, the Swedenborg Society, um, which goes back to 1810, the Scientific and Medical Networks and Educational Charity. The work I do with young people, that's through an educational charity. Uh, and so ed education is, is for me, is, is really primary. It's the main sort of theme um, of, my, of my life and, and my activity. Yeah, wonderful. So there are coming up uh, new things in your, on your site. Can you, um, for November, can you uh, give a little bit an overview and name again your, um, the website and where people find these programs? Yes, well, uh, there are a couple of websites. Um, the ones, one for webinars is mysticsandscientists.org. <clears throat> uh, and there um, you'll find some of the webinars that we've coming up, we're coming up um, in November. We've got Kim Pemberthy um, <clears throat> from the University of Virginia. Um, and then we've got one on the meaning of travel, um, which is rather different. Um, Emily Thomas speaking on the 17th. And then we've got Jim Garrison talking about humanity rising, which is his new, a new, um, <clears throat> um, his new initiative online, which some of you may have, may have heard of. And then into December, we, we, we've got uh, complexity and tipping points and secularity and science. And so all of these things will be uh, on our website. And then our main event in November is our Beyond the Brain <clears throat> event which is beyondthebrain.org. That's from the 6th to the 8th of November. So just after the you know, All Souls and All Saints days. And, and that's that we've got a three day online conference, which people can find out about. And, and our more general website is <clears throat> simednet.org, S-C-I-M-E-D-N-E-T.org. Um, and our, um, the, the site that where we're um, trying to expand the scientific worldview beyond a materialistic approach. That's GalileoCommission.org. Um, and the reason we're using the Galileo metaphor, if you like, is that we're inviting scientists to look through the telescope, not to pretend there's nothing on the other side of the telescope, but to look through the telescope at evidence that suggests that um, the material interpretation of things is one side, but it leaves out the whole of the inside, you know, which we were talking about before. So we're very good on outer space in our science at the moment, and we're not so good on the inner space. And that's what we need to be exploring equally. And then my education site um, for my education program for young people 
is inspiringpurpose.org.uk. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a sort of full range of um, activity. Okay. And I have a book coming out next year, which I <clears throat> shall also mention, called A Quest for Wisdom. And this is being published in, in the spring, um, and uh, there'll be a certain amount of activity around that as well. And in this book, if I am right, that you have also a chapter about death and dying. I have a whole section on death and dying, yes, um, yeah. including the presidential addresses from the Swedenborg Society, uh, where I talk about Swedenborg and, and, and the soul um, and his understanding of death. So yes, absolutely. So wonderful. And I hope we can give some inspiration that <laughs> death is not the end. We can first live fully and then when death comes, comes we can use it as an experience and as you said letting go and probably enjoying it so i hope so we can be able to do that so i thank you very much and i see you in one of your uh, events well very a soon. pleasure and, and thank you very much indeed for having me on mm -hmm. thank you